Good morning, everybody, afternoon, wherever you are. This is Nanette Kennedy with Humanities Team and the Evolution Revolution, and we are having our Conversations with God book discussion group, and we are currently on book two and uh, chapter 19. And I can't give you a page number because my pagination is different because this is two, this is Conversations two and three in one book, so... Uh, anyway, I'd like to welcome everybody and let you all know that uh, Linda has very graciously volunteered to uh, do the reading since Michelle's taken some time off, and I really appreciate it. And I also wanted to mention that four days from now is Awakening Day, and I was thinking of and I'll put this up on the Evolution Revolution page, but I was thinking that it might be kind of a nice thing to do, um, if, especially for the Americans or the Europeans or the UK, if, if you feel so inclined to help save our country, um, <laughs> our government, I should say. Um, but anyway, if we did some... Something which I haven't really figured out what it is at the moment, but something that you just post on your own Facebook page about. Um, there's a million quotes out there about how we have to build something new instead of just keeping with the old in order to make the changes in our country. And you probably can hear my dogs, so I'm going to go on mute. And I'm going to hand it over to Linda, and you can go ahead and start reading whenever you're ready, Linda. Okay. Thank you. So this is Chapter 19, and Neil starts with, I've rarely seen you so indignant. God doesn't become indignant. This proves you're not God. God is everything, and God becomes everything. There is nothing which God is not and all that God is experiencing of itself. God is experiencing in, as, and through you. It is your indignation which you are feeling. You're right, because I agree with everything you've said. Know that every thought I am sending you, you are receiving through the filter of your own experience, of your own truth, of your own understandings, and of your own decisions, choices, and declarations about who you are and who you choose to be. There's no other way you can receive it. There's no other way you should. Well, here we go again. Are you saying that none of these ideas and feelings are yours? That this whole book could be wrong? Are you telling me that this entire experience of my conversation with you could be nothing more than a thing? Consider the possibility that I'm giving you your thoughts and feelings on a thing, where do you suppose these are coming from? That I am co-creating with you your experiences, that I am a part of your decisions, choices, and declarations. Consider the possibility that I have chosen you, among, along with many others, to be my messenger long before this- Excuse me. Yeah? It, um, I'm on the phone, but it's hard to hear you. I'm just letting you know. Okay. I've got my volume turned up as loud as I can. I'm not sure what else. Okay. All right. Just, thank you. I'll try. Maybe I'll read a, try and talk a little louder. Thank you. Linda, is there a way on my end that I can turn your volume up? I don't know. Let me just see what I can. Yeah, because I. Yeah, because I can hear you very, very clearly. Okay, just a second. Uh, more. It does not. It does not look like I can do that, which is kind of weird in a system like this. But is everybody else able to hear Linda? Um, it's a, it's a little, um, you're a little quiet. It, um, okay. yeah, I, I had to turn off my volume very hard, very up to, to listen. 
Um, do you have a headset, Linda? I didn't bring one with me, no. Okay. Um, but good idea, huh? Um, okay, now I tried to do my audio and it put a thing up on top of the screen so I can't see the book. Okay, I'll, I'll read louder today and tomorrow or next Sunday. I'll try and have a headset. Maybe that would be better. Okay. Uh, okay, so. Thanks, Linda. I'm just trying to figure out where I was now. Okay, so uh, consider the possibility. I have chosen you along with many Do you others. you see that's hard for me to believe? Yes, well, I'm coming up to that. Okay. I was just going to do the transition. Consider the possibility that I have chosen you along with many others to be my messenger long before this book came to be. That's hard for me to believe. Yes, we went over all of that in book one, yet I will speak to this world and I will do it among other ways through my teachers and messengers. And in this book, I will tell you your world that, is econo that its economic, political, social, and religious systems are primitive. I observe that you have the collective arrogance to think that they are the best. I see the largest number of you resisting any change or improvement which takes anything away from you, never mind who it might help. I say again, what is needed on your planet is a massive shift in consciousness, a change in your awareness, a renewed respect for all life, and a deepened understanding of interrelatedness of everything. Well, if you're God, you're God. If you don't want things the way they are, why don't you change them? As I have explained to you before, my decision from the beginning has been to give you the freedom to create your life, and hence, yourself, as you wish to be. You cannot know yourself as the creator if I tell you what to create, how to create, and then force, require, or cause you to do so. If I do that, my purpose is lost. But now, let us just once, let us just notice what has been created on your planet and see if it doesn't make you a bit indignant. Let's look at just four inside pages of one of your major daily newspapers on a typical day. Pick up today's paper. Okay. It's Saturday, April 9th, 1994, and I'm looking at the San Francisco Chronicle. Good. Open it to any page. All right, here's page A7. Fine. What do you see there? The headline develops, says, Developing Nations to Discuss Labor Rights. Excellent. Go on. The story reports on what is called an old schism between industrialized nations and developing nations over labor rights. Leaders of some of the developing nations are said to be fearful that a campaign to expand labor rights could create a backdoor means of barring their low-wage products from the rich nation's consumer markets. It goes on to say that negotiators for Brazil, Malaysia, India, Singapore, and other developing nations have refused to establish a permanent committee of the World Trade Organization, which would be changed with drafting a labor rights policy. What rights is the story talking about? It says basic rights for workers, such as prohibitions on forced labor, establishment of workplace safety standards, and guarantee of the opportunity to bargain collectively. And why do developing nations not want such rights as a part of an international agreement? I'll tell you why, but first, Let's get clear that it's not the workers in those countries who resist such rights. Those negotiators for the developing nations are the same people or are closely allied with the same people who own and run the factories. In other words, the rich and powerful. As in the days before the labor movement in America, those are the people now benefiting from mass exploitation of workers. You can be sure that they are being quietly assisted by big money in the U.S. and in other rich nations where industrialists, no longer able to unfairly exploit workers in their own nations, are 
some contracting to factory owners in these developing countries or building their own plants there in order to exploit foreign workers who are still unprotected from being used by others to increase their already obscene profits. But the story says it's our government, the present administration, which is pushing for workers' rights to be part of the worldwide trade agreement. Correct. Your current leader, Bill Clinton, is a man who believes in basic workers' rights, even if your powerful industrialists do not. He is courageously fighting big money's vested interests. Other American presidents and leaders throughout the world have been killed for less. Are you saying President Clinton is going to be murdered? Let's just say there are going to be tremendous powers attempting to remove him from office. They've got to get him out of there, just as they had to remove John Kennedy 30 years ago. Like Kennedy before him, Bill Clinton is doing everything big money hates, not only pressing for workers worldwide, right, workers' rights worldwide, but siding with the little person over the entrenched establishment on virtually every social question. He believes it's the right of every person, for instance, to have access to adequate health care. Whether or not he or she can afford to pay the exorbitant prices and fees that America's medical community has come to enjoy. He said that these costs have got to come down. That has not made him very popular with another very large segment of America's rich and powerful, the pharmaceutical factories, to the insurance conglomerates, from the medical corporations, to the business owners having to provide decent coverage for their workers. A great many people are now making a lot of money, who are now making a lot of money, are going to have to make a little bit less if America's poor are to be given universal health care. This is not making Clinton the most popular man in town, at least not among certain elements, who have already proven in this century that they have the ability to remove a president from office. Are you saying, I'm saying, that the struggle between the haves and the haves not has been going on forever, and it is epidemic on your planet. It will never be thus so long as economic interests rather than humanitarian man's body and not man's soul is man's highest concern. Well, I guess you're right. On page A14 of the same paper, there's a headline, Recession Spawns Anger in Germany. The lower headline reads, with joblessness at post-war high, rich and poor grow further apart. Yes. And what does the story say? It says there is great torment among the countries laid off, torment maybe, among the countries laid off engineers, professors, scientists, factory workers, carpenters, and cooks. It says that the nation has encountered some economic setbacks, and that there are widespread feelings this hardship has not been fairly distributed. That is correct. It has not been. Does the story say what has caused so many layoffs? Yes. It says the angry employees are workers whose employers have moved to countries where labor is cheaper. Ah, I wonder whether many people reading your San Francisco Chronicle on this day saw the connection between the stories on pages A7 and A14. The story also points out that when layoffs come, female workers are the first to go. It says women compromise, comprise more than half of the jobless, jobless nationwide and nearly two-thirds of it in the East. Of course, well, I continue to point out Though most of you do not want to see it or admit it, that your socioeconomic mechanism systematically discriminates against classes of people. You are not providing equal opportunity to all while you are loudly protesting that you are. You need to believe your fiction about this, though in order to keep feeling good about yourself and you generally resent anyone who shows you the truth. You will deny the evidence even when it is presented to you. Yours is a society of ostriches. Well, what else does the newspaper say today? 
On page A4 is a story announcing a new federal pressure to end the housing bias. It says federal housing officials are putting together a plan that would force the most serious efforts ever to eliminate racial discrimination in housing. What you must ask yourself is why must such efforts be forced? Well, we have a Fair Housing Act which bars discrimination in housing on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, national origin, disability, or family composition. Yet many communities have done little to eliminate such bias. Many people in this country still feel that a person ought to be able to do what he wants to with his own private property, including rent or not rent to whomever he chooses. Yes, if everyone who owned rental property were allowed to make such choices, and if those choices tended to reflect a group consciousness and a generalized attitude towards certain categories and classes of people, then entire segments of the popula population would be systemically, systematically eliminated from any opportunity to find decent places in which to live. And the, in the absence of decent affordable housing, land barons and slumlords would be able to charge exorbitant prices for terrible dwellings, providing little or no upkeep. And once again, the rich and powerful exploit the masses, this time under the guise of property rights. Well, property owners should have some rights. Yet, when do the rights of the few infringe upon the rights of the many? That is, and has always been, the question facing every civilized society. Does there come a time when the higher good of all supersedes individual rights? Does society have a responsibility to itself? Your fair housing laws are your way of saying yes. All the failures to follow and enforce those laws are the rich and powerful way of saying no, all that counts are our rights. Once again, your current president and his administration is forcing the issue. Not all American presidents, presidents have been so willing to confront the rich and powerful on yet another front. Now, I see that. The newspaper article says that the Clinton administration housing officials have initiated more investigations of housing discrimination in the brief time they've been in office than were investigated in the prior 10 years. A spokesperson for the Fair Housing Alliance, a national advisory group in Washington, said that the Clinton administration's insistence that fair housing statutes be obeyed was something that they had tried to get other administrations to do for years. And so, with this current president, makes even more enemies among the rich and powerful, manufacturers and industrialists, drug companies and insurance firms, doctors and medical conglomerates, and investment property owners all people with money and influence. As observed earlier, look for Clinton to have a tough time staying in office. Even as this is being written, April 1994, the pressure is mounting against him. Does your April 9, 1994 edition of the newspaper tell you anything else about the human race? Well, back on page A14, there's a picture of a Russian political leader brandishing his fists. Beneath the photograph is a news story headlined, Zerkovsky assaults colleagues in parliament. The article notes that Vladimir Zerkovsky got into another fist fight today, beating up a political opponent and screaming in his face, I'll have you rot in jail. I'll tear your beard out hair by hair. And you wonder why nations go to war. Here's a major leader of a massive political movement, and in the halls of parliament, he has to prove his manhood by beating up his opponents. Yours is a very primitive race, where strength is all you understand. There is no true law on your planet. True law is natural law, inexplicable, and not needed to be explained or taught. It's observable. True law is that law by which the people freely agree to be governed because they to be governed because they are governed by it naturally. Their agreement is therefore not so much an agreement as it is a mutual recognition 
of what is so. These laws don't have to be enforced. They already are enforced by simple expedient, by the simple expedient of undeniable consequence. Let me give you an example. Highly evolved beings do not hit themselves on the head with a hammer because it hurts. They also don't hit anyone else on the hammer for the same re on the head with a hammer for the same reason. Evolved beings have no have noticed that if you hit someone with a hammer, that person gets hurt. If you keep doing it, that person gets angry. If you keep getting him angry, he finds a hammer of his own, and eventually he hits you back. Evolved beings know, therefore know, that if you hit someone else with a hammer, you are going to get yourself hit with a hammer. It makes no difference if you have more hammers or bigger hammers. Sooner or later, you're going to get hurt. The result is observable. Now, non-evolved beings, primitive beings, they observe the same thing. They simply don't care. Evolved beings are not willing to play the one with the biggest hammer wins. Primitive beings play nothing else. Incidentally, this is largely a male game. Among your species, very few women are willing to play hammers hurt. They play a new game. They say, if I had a hammer, I'd hammer out justice. I'd hammer out freedom. I'd hammer out love between my brothers and my sisters all over this land. Wait a minute, are you saying women are more evolved than men? I'm making no judgment one way or the other on that. I simply observe. You see truth, like natural law, is observable. Now, any law that is not a natural law is not observable. And so that has to be explained to you. You have to be told why it's for your own good. It has to be shown to you. This is not an easy task, because if a thing is for your own good, it is self-evident. Only that which is not self-evident has to be explained to you. It takes a very unusual and determined person to convince people of something which is not self-evident. For this purpose, you have invented politicians and clergy. Scientists don't say much. They're not usually very talkative. They don't have to be. If they construct an experiment and it succeeds, they simply show you what they've done. The results speak for themselves. So scientists are usually quiet types, not given to verbosity. It is not necessary. The reason for their work is self-evident. Furthermore, if they try something and fail, they have nothing to say. Not so with politicians. Even if they've failed, they talk. In fact, sometimes the more they fail, the more they talk. The same is true of religions. The more they fail, the more they talk. Yet I can tell you this, truth and God are found in the same place, in the silence. When you have found God and when you have found truth, it is not necessary to talk about it. It is self-evident. If you are talking about God, it is probably because you are still searching. That's okay. That's all right. Just know where you are. But teachers talk about God all the time. That's all we talk about in this book. You teach what you choose to learn. And yes, this book does, this book does speak about me as well about life, which makes this book a very good case in point. You have engaged yourself in writing this book because you are still searching. Yes, indeed. And the same is true for those who are reading it. But we are on the subject of creation. You asked me at the beginning of this chapter why, if I don't like what I was seeing on earth, I don't change it. I have no judgment about what you do. I merely observe it, and from time to time, as I have done in this book, describe it. But now I must ask you, forget my observations and forget my descriptions. How do you feel about what you've deserved, observed on your planet's creations, of your planet's creations? You've taken just one day's stories out of the newspaper, and so far you've covered nations refusing to grant basic rights to workers, the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer in the face of a depression in Germany, the government having to force property owners to, pair, to obey fair housing laws in the United States, 
and a powerful leader telling opponents, I'll have you rot in jail, I'll tear your beard out, beard out hair by hair, while punching him in the face on the floor of the national legislature in Russia. Anything else this newspaper has to show me about your civilized society? Well, there's a story on page A13, headlined, Civilians Suffer Most in a Golan War. The uh, drophead says, in rebel areas, top guns live in luxury while many thousands starve. Enough. I'm getting the picture. And this is just one day's paper. One section of one day's paper. I haven't gotten out of section A. And so I say again, your world's economic, political, social, and religious systems are primitive. I will do nothing to change that for reasons I have given. You must have free choice and free will in these matters in order for you to experience my highest goal for you, which is to know yourself as the creator. And so far, after all these thousands of years, this is how far you have evolved. This is what you've created. Does it not make you indignant? Yet you have done one good thing. You have come to me for advice. Repeatedly, your civilization has turned to God, asking, where did we go wrong? How can we do better? The fact that you have systematically ignored my advice on every other occasion does not stopping me from help offering it again. Like a good parent, I'm always willing to offer a helpful observation when asked. And also like a good parent, I'm willing to keep loving you, even if I'm ignored. So I'm describing things as they really are. And I'm telling you how you can do better. I'm doing so in a way which causes you to feel some indignation because I want to get your attention. I see that I've done so. This is what could cause the kind of massive conscious shift of which you've spoken now repeatedly in this book. There is a slow chipping away happening. We are gradually stripping the block of granite, which is the human experience of its unwanted excess as a sculptor chips away to create and reveal the true beauty of the final carving. We, you and I, through our work in these books and a great many others, messengers all, the writers, the artists, the television and movie producers, the musicians, the singers, the actors, the dancers, the teachers, the shamans, the gurus, the politicians, the leaders. Yes, there are some very good ones, some very sincere ones, the doctors, the lawyers, Yes, there are some very good ones, some very sincere ones. The moms and dads, the grandmas and grandpas in living rooms and kitchens and backyards all over America and all around the world. You are the forebearers, the harbingers, and the consciousness of many people is shifting because of you. Will it take a worldwide calamity, a disaster of gargantuan proportions, as some have suggested? Must Earth tilt on its axis, be hit by a meteor, swallow its continents whole before people will listen? Must we be visited again from outer space and scared out of our minds before having sufficient sight to realize that we're all one? Is it required that we all face the threat of death before we can gal be galvanized to find a new way to live? Such dramatic events are not necessary, but they could occur. Will they occur? Do you imagine that the future is predictable even by God? I tell you this, the future is creatable. Create it as you want it. But earlier, you said that the true moment of time is here is no future, that all things are happening in the instant moment, the moment, the forever moment of now. Yes, that's true. Well, are there earthquakes and floods and meteors hitting the, hitting the planet right now, or aren't there? Don't tell me that as God, you don't know. Do you want these things to happen? Of course not. But you said everything's going to happen already. It's already happened. It's happening now. That is true. But the eternal moment of now is also forever changing. 
It is like a mosaic, one that is always there, but constantly shifting. You can't blink because it will be different when you open your eyes again. Watch, look, see, there it goes again. I am constantly changing. What makes you change? Your idea about me, your thought about all of it is what changes it instantly. Sometimes the change in the all is subtle, virtually indiscernible, depending upon the power of the thought. But when there is an intense thought, or a collective thought, then there is tremendous impact, incredible effect. Everything changes. So, will there be a major worldwide calamity you speak of? I don't know, will there? You decide. Remember, you're choosing your reality now. I choose for it not to happen. Then it will not happen, unless it does. Here we go again. Yes, and you must learn to live with the contradiction, and you must understand the greatest truth. Nothing matters. Nothing matters? I'll explain in book three. Well, okay, but I don't like to have to wait on these things. There is much here for you to absorb already. Give yourself some time. Give yourself some space. Can we not leave yet? I sense you're leaving. You're always talking like that when you get ready to leave. I'd like to talk about a few other things, such as, for instance, beings for out of space. Are there such things? Actually, we're going to cover that in uh, two in book three. Oh, come on, give me a break. Give me, give me a glimpse. Give me a peek. You want to know if there's intelligence life, intelligent life elsewhere in the universe? Yes, of course. Is it as primitive as ours? Some of the life forms are more primitive, some less so, and some are far more advanced. Have we been visited by extraterrestrial be beings? Yes, many times. For what purpose? To inquire? In some cases, to gently assist? How do they assist? Oh, they give a boost now and then. For instance, surely you're aware that you've made more technological process progress in the last 75 years than in all of human history before that. Yes, I suppose so. Do you imagine that every from, everything from CAT scanners to supersonic flight to computer chips you embed in your body to regulate your heart all came from the mind of man? Well, yes. Then why didn't man think them up thousands of years before? Before? Well, I don't know. Technology wasn't available. I mean, I guess one thing leads to another, but beginning technology wasn't there until it was. It's all a process of evolution. You don't find it strange that in this billion-year process of evolution, somewhere around 75 to 100 years ago, there was a huge comprehension explosion? You don't see it as outside the pattern that many people now on the planet have seen development of everything from radio to radar to radonics in their lifetime? You don't get that what has happened here represents a quantum leap, a step forward of such great magnitude and proportion as to defy any progress, progression of logic? What are you saying? I'm saying consider the possibility you've been helped. But if we've been helped technologically, why aren't we being helped spiritually? Why aren't we being given some assistance on this consciousness shift? You are. I am? What do you think this book is? Hmm. In addition, every day, new ideas, new thoughts, new concepts are being placed in front of you. The process of shifting the consciousness, increasing the spiritual awareness of an entire planet, is a slow process. It takes time and great patience, lifetimes, generations. Yet slowly, you are coming around. Generally, you are shifting. Quietly, there is change. And you're telling me that beings from outer space are helping with that. Indeed, they are among you now, many of them. They've been helping for years. Well, why don't they then make themselves known, reveal themselves? Wouldn't that render their impact twice as great? Their purpose is to assist in the change they see that most of you desire, not to create it, to foster, not force. Where they 
were they to reveal themselves, you would be forced by the sheer power of their presence to accord them great honor and give them words of great wisdom, great, and give their words great weight with wisdom. Wisdom which comes from within is not nearly as so easily discarded as wisdom that comes from another. You tend to hang on a lot longer to that which you've created to the, than to that which you have been told. Will we ever see them, ever come to know these extraterrestrial visits as who they really are? Oh, yes. The time will come when your consciousness will rise and your fear will subside, and then you, they will be able to reveal themselves to you. Some of them have already done so with a handful of people. What about the theory now becoming more and more popular that these beings are actually malevolent, that there uh, are there some who mean us harm? Are there some human beings who mean you harm? Well, yes, of course. Some of these beings, the lesser involved, may be judged by you in the same way. Yet remember my injunction, judge not. No one does anything inappropriate, given one's model of the universe. Some beings have advanced in their technology, but not in their thinking. Your race is rather like that. But what if these malevolent beings are so technologically advanced, surely they could destroy us. What's to stop them? You are being protected. We are? Yes. You are being given the opportunity to live out your own destiny, your own consciousness, Which means, which means that it, in this, as in all things, what you think is what you get. What you fear is what you draw to you. What you resist persists. What you look at disappears, giving you a chance to recreate it all over again, if you wish, or banner, banish it forever from your experience. What you choose, you experience. Hmm, somehow it doesn't seem that way in my life. Because you doubt the power. You doubt me. That's probably not a good idea. Definitely not. Thank you. It Thanks, Linda. And your voice did, um, it, it came out much better. Yeah, the volume was great. Um, it just never ceases to amaze me. A book that was written in 1994 can be so pertinent in now 2017. I mean, there's just I so many places just ticked off, you know, with a just a pen mark. There's this whole thing about the newspapers and. Um, in our next administration, I just I feel like this is almost um, like Neil was having a premonition of things to come without changing. I mean, by even using uh, President Clinton as an example. Um, It's almost eerie, like, it, I'm sorry, when I was reading it, it was almost eerie how I'm like, are you sure this headline was from 1994? Because it sounds like almost identical, even with like the Russian. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was like, where, are you sure it's from 1994? Because it kind of sounds like a headline that, you know, we could be seeing or hearing today because it's all the same things. But I mean, it's good because these issues are not going away. And so, and that gives me hope that maybe there's however slow the progress at least these, they, they're still staying relevant and it's still something that people are working on and it's still like well I hope we have progress yeah. I, I agree I, I thought it was really interesting hearing him talk about Clinton now now that we know what's happened with, with Clinton it really makes it much clearer why they hate Clinton so much. It wasn't Monica. 
Monica was an excuse that they used, but it was really this other stuff that, that uh, Neil's talking about right now in this chapter that really got him in their targets. Which is what happened with Barack Obama. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I see what's going on right now is the last big pushback of um, separation cosmology and it's brought not only humanity but this beautiful diverse living planet to her knees but whether or not humanity continues on the earth will continue on and um, it's uh, as I said on other book club meetings. I think that what's going on in our world right now is going to be made into the most spectacularly, really um, funny movie um, when we, you know, when we finally make that leap of faith, there's more balance between the divine masculine and the divine feminine. Like women don't send their children off to wars. <laughs> you know, it's, um, anyway, it's, my hope is that none of us here take it personally what's what's occurring right now and that we continue to inspire each other and to just be the best person we can be in any given day and i will say too um with all the things that are going on around the world even um I find myself being, I don't want to say tested because I don't think God's playing games here. Um, but I do feel tested because it's, I'm going through a phase of difficulty in not being judgmental. Or, you know, my husband watches the news all the time and I walk through the living room and I hear something and I back up because I go, what did he just say? You know, I, I my attitude about it is this one of disbelief, um, and, and it, you know, Breno was just mentioning the issue with the Russians that we're having right now with other people as well, and uh, it, it's just it's kind of a mind blowing thing because you're thinking the world has tried very difficult and a very the world has had a real difficult time getting better and becoming more cohesive. And there's this thing going on now that makes it feel like, oh, great. It's all going to crumble. Um, I don't think in reality that it all is going to crumble, but I think the veil is going to continue to be lifted over I think that powerless feeling that watching the news gives me that like I'm like oh I can't do anything to stop this like you know exactly like what you know or maybe I'm just being judgmental when I say it. I feel like I know exactly what these mistakes are going to do to like the cosmos to the universe to the planet um but in Neil's chapter, what I took away is that we're creating our own like experience. So in that sense, like maybe I can just create like a little cubby hole where I fly <laughs> under the radar, radar of all the like things that are happening. And then I could like come out like a little mouse when it's all over. You just <laughs> made me split my lip. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know that feeling. And you're certainly not alone because lately because I don't want to be in the dark, you know, about what's going on on our planet. I'll watch, you know, headline, just headline news um, so that I don't feel like I've got my head in the sand like an ostrich because I think that that's problematic as well. And I know for some people, they quit watching the news. My daughter who's 29, dissolved her Facebook account because she said she couldn't handle all the negativity. And I was talking to someone this morning, and I said, you know what? Uh, this person said to me, they had put
put up a post on her, her page that said, anybody who is uh, not voting for Trump or anybody that believes in global climate change, you know, a half a dozen other things, this person was going to unfriend all the, those people that they could tell were not going to support Trump or not support the science behind climate change. And I laughed and I said, well, thank you very much. You're going to help me do some house cleaning because I, you know, I'm fortunate that most people on my Facebook page have been pretty mellow with this whole transition and, and the global climate change. And, you know, I'll have somebody say something minor. Um, but for my 29-year-old daughter to be just so incensed, and she's embarrassed to be an American, um, to just say no more. And I, I, get, I get it. Um, but it makes me sad because I, I liked communicating with her on Facebook and sharing things with her. But we, like you were saying, Brenna, that we're creating our own reality. And if the reality we're seeing via the news or social media, um, if that's doing the creating for us, you know, I just I I just don't get into it. But many of you know I am like so non confrontational. You have to get me so freaked out and angry to for me to say, Whoa, you know. Um and that, that can be problematic. But over. I'm similar to you, Nanette. Like it takes a long time before I say, Okay, I've had enough. But, you know, if, if I find myself being triggered by the news or what's going on, you know, I, I'm learning to run and comfort myself, my sweet, sweet, innocent self, because life is innocent. And, um, you know, that we've got men in 60, 70, 80-year-old bodies that are still like toddlers, right? And, it, you know, in terms of their emotion, um yeah at some level we have to have compassion for them but you know i don't think i think that maybe we're going to have Mich michelle obama as our president in 2020 i think so and i think that you know if your daughter is you know embarrassed that she's an american like look at all the good that the United States of America does whenever there's a disaster They're always the first ones there. So there's so much benevolence in the United States and uh, There's way more goodness and kindness than there is meanness Done um, That's interesting you said that because especially coming from you because she's also said she's thinking a lot about Canada lately <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I don't know that, I mean, there was, I had fleeting thoughts. I told Sarah, I, I was ready to go to Scotland because I looked good in plaid and knee socks. Um, but I, running away isn't, I guess, I, I, bottom line, it's not going to change anything. And I don't want to leave the rest of the country so that it all becomes the way that I don't want to see it become. Diane, do you have your hand up? You're on mute. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I was uh, thinking of my hand as well. Okay. It is difficult because we are seven billions co-creating on the planet, and the Hammer game as is not over at all. Uh, I'm not in the States. I'm a Canadian living in Chile, but here I have um, a lot of reason you probably don't hear about to be very ashamed as well of what's going on. And running away is not the clue. I think we, we just have to cultivate the presence in our, our everyday and see when we are using the armor of ourselves and, and have faith that this will have a positive effect on the long run. It, it's so important 
last weekend I was invited by a friend to uh, spend the New Year's with them and by the fireworks in Valparaiso and everything. And one is of his older cousin, she's 65, was with us. And uh, she drove me crazy all the weekend. My big work was not to do that and <laughs> to stay as cool as she was babbling about love and all the new age discourse all the time and sp spiting venom all the time. And since I was trying and would try to make me talk bad about Chile, and since I was not doing it, she was always coming back to make me do it. And uh, I was telling her that truly, I thought that most people were good. And insisted that truly, everyone is very, very bad, except her. And she's talking about love and everything all the time. So I tried to enter in another angle, and I said, oh, that's interesting. And did you, are you able to identify the variable that make you so different? because it would be different, important to know how you became a good person so we could try to educate and repeat the experience. <laughs> I felt, and having her thought thinking, <laughs> she just continued. But she's not the only one, and she, we all can be her in some moment in our days. I hope that not too much in my life, <laughs> but this is where everything starts. And we cannot do more than that. And certainly not run away, even though we, we feel like it sometimes, but you will find it over in other countries. And, you, and I know that when I listen to the, the news, I listen to Radio Canada every morning on TV, uh, TV sign. I'm not always cry, proud. It's better than uh, now that Justin Trudeau is the prime minister, it was worse before, but I'm not always proud either. So we just have to stick there. And we have to remember that Canada endured an administration for, was it eight years or 10 years, um, that was very neoconservative and it was Justin Trudeau who came in and, um, you know, like humanity, we are resilient and we're innocent no matter what no matter what, we're innocent, and we just have to, in our own personal lives, for me, I have to love myself, because I was programmed, my innocence was programmed very early on, not to love myself, to place all these conditions on my acceptability, and my worthiness, and you know, I'm not the only one. We're still lining up our children in rows, like we did 300 years ago in our schools, and teaching them to conform, rather than create, um, it's, you know, but we've, you know, we are moving in the right direction. I feel that. And I feel that, you know, women are starting to have a voice and that voice for women was led by the United States. You know, it was the sixties and seventies and that came from the United States. So I'm very grateful. Done. I don't think Michelle will run as much as we all want her. I think I saw an interview where she said she had no interest in it whatsoever. Um, but things could change though. That's true. That's true. That's true. Uh, energetically, it feels like For that to happen in four years, we, you know, a lot would have to change between now and then, um, and, and and it can change in a heartbeat. So it's not that it isn't possible. Um, it's you know what what I sees happened is uh, you know where we find ourselves now is where we absolutely need to be because the same problems that Clinton tried to fix, the same problems that Kennedy set out to try to fix, the same problems that Martin Luther tried to fix, the same problems that Ken Bobby Kennedy tried to fix, 
you know, they're still all with us. And the difference, what I feel like energetically is the difference is that now it's not just one of them anymore. It's millions of us. They can't kill us all. That's the difference. That's where we are now. Is It used to be that it was just one guy out there, you know, and now it's like, it's not just, there's some guys out there, there's people like Van Jones and Cory Booker, and, but then there's these millions of women that are, that are banding together and coming forward, and it's, it's going to happen. There, there's ugliness that will happen, but there's beauty that will result. One of the experience that proved that you're right, Linda, is when you look at the work done by AVAS, Amnesty International, The Sum of Us, Change.org. We are getting great success at international level or national level, and they are being huge. Uh, and this is when people, we all get together. And, and that gives me a lot of hope. Uh, here in Chile, a little girl that the medication is terribly, uh, prices too high and finally forced the government to, to pay for it when they yes said no. But try, try, change or put a petition and then they do. And people would got liberated by um, Amnesty International. So it is a proof that there is a, a citizenship, massive citizenship that works, and like HD or the Movement for Civil Rights of the, the Soul, and, and it will work. It, it is working, you're right, Linda, it is working. It's yeah. just that it's really difficult to see it that someone who's been liberated who got their medication. It's yeah. not that concrete. Well, and yeah, because in 1994, oh, I'm sorry, Christine. No, no, go ahead, Brenna. I was going to say in 1994 when that article was published, you know, we didn't have anything even close to the Affordable Care Act and there was the, I mean, it's not perfect, but it's, it's, I remember during that time, it, there, I grew up especially poor in America and getting health care, it was almost impossible and by the time you'd get to the doctor, you weren't sick anymore and they're like, just give you antibiotics because they're like, well, if you had something and you stop back, you know, it was just, it was just really a shamble of a system and, and when Clinton came in and did change a lot of that, it helped a lot of people. And then now that we have like, so it is the same, like we're still addressing some of the issues, but there is progress on it because that is something that um, people are willing to stand up for. And it's not going away. It's still a relevant issue. And until we get where we need to go, if ever, it'll still be relevant. But we are getting there. And, you know, look at Global Oneness Day. You know, what is this going to be our eighth Global Oneness Day? And on our seventh Global Oneness Day, we hit record achievements. We used a forum called the Amplifield, created by my friend Todd Jason. And, you know, like, there's more and more of us out there. Like, it, we have to just believe that we are miraculous and that we're innocent and then, you know, the innocence has been hacked and that's what's been coming to me in the last three or four weeks. And, you know, it has been hacked in so many ways, but not only by our education system, but in just by who we are, you know, but, you know, when we look, when I look back in my 63 years, how far we've come, like, it's incredible. It is miraculous, right? It, it just is. And when I, you know, this year I had a garden for the very first time. I had my backyard redone. But I planted a seed, different kinds of seeds, and what came out of those different seeds. It, it is a miracle. Like, life is a miracle. And we've been programmed, our innocence has been programmed to believe that it's not, that it's heavy and dense. And, you know, that's what Neil's books speak to, right? Yep. And I was just going to add, because we're a couple minutes over here, but, if you had the opportunity to see uh, the webinar that HT did last week that had Barbara Marks Hubbard, uh, Nassim Haramine. Yes, I did. Okay, and then um, Bruce Lipton and Steve Farrell. Bruce Lipton, I thought, said something that could really apply um, to the story you told us, Diane, about your sister or sister-in-law. Um, 
And so I think it can be applied on a really uh, intimate level as well as, you know, a country level and a global level. And that is when you find yourself in the presence of somebody who, let's say, they don't believe in climate change. You know, you can change that conversation and say, well, let's talk about something we can agree on, something that we both find very important. And he believes that's how we're going to get through this globally, is that if we can always remember, we've got to find our common ground and, you know, that we are all connected. And as Neil has been telling us through all these books, remembering that we are one even when it's really difficult because you want to slap somebody that's because I know somebody exactly like your sister-in-law um, and and I call those people button pushers but I'm the one that pr provides the buttons I put them out there um, but I again because I'm non-confrontational I will do my very best to just mm-hmm 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 you know um, not that I haven't ever come up and said, are you kidding me? You don't believe in love? <laughs> you know. Uh, so anyway, uh, does anybody have any closing thoughts before we sign off? I just wanted to say that Barbara, Max Hubbard, and um, Mark Gaffney have started an evolutionary church, and it's on Saturday mornings, and it's at, via Zoom. And I think this Saturday will be week 12. If anybody's interested, it's open to all. And we're talking about positive evolution instead of devolution. Thank you for that. I was there yesterday. Great. I'm grateful. I've been there since the beginning, and I really find it helpful. And, and you know, yesterday I, I found myself getting really triggered um, after the the church and then I just went back to like okay calm down just focus on your breath right nope, we're all doing what we can do and I really appreciate everyone here me too and the the focus of the evolutionary church is to, to see the outrageous lover in everyone and I know that's hard with Donald Trump but I, I'm calling him orange Julius from here on out <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, everybody. I'm yep. glad we're back together, and Happy New Year. Yep, Happy New Year to everybody, and I will be uploading this later this afternoon, and I'll put it up in all the normal places. Much love in 2017. Much love. Much love to you. It's so nice to see everybody. Yes, bye. it is. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.